Okay, uh, so uh, welcome everyone to the last lecture uh, of the course. Uh, we have in fact uh, covered almost uh, all of the technical uh, uh, issues that uh, we wanted to cover. Uh, so uh, this will be a somewhat shorter lecture, at least I think it will be a somewhat shorter lecture than usual. Uh, and I just wanted to have uh, some discussion uh, and uh, wrap up a few things that uh, you know uh, we, we didn't quite clear up uh, in the previous lectures. Uh, so uh, let me, in fact, uh, start from where we uh, left off yesterday. Uh, so at, in yesterday's lecture, uh, the uh, issue that we were discussing uh, was that if one uses uh, some general properties uh, from statistical mechanics, uh, then it's possible to derive an inequality on operators. And the inequality has this form. Sorry, the inequality on how much... Uh, the expectation value of an operator changes under a unitary low energy excitation. And this, this inequality, which is some general inequality in statistical mechanics, uh, has this form. Uh, and it's valid where this delta E is the energy that the unitary inserts into the state, this unitary inserts into the state. Uh, and uh, it's valid in the limit where beta delta E is much smaller than one. So it's valid in the limit where uh, you know, the, the unitary inserts uh, an energy that's, uh, that's much smaller than the temperature of the system. Uh, and the claim is that uh, under such an excitation, the expectation value of any observable should not change much. Uh, and it looked like, uh, you know, if you take this unitary, for instance, to be the uh, exponential of the Schwarzschild number operator, so that it rephases modes which are outside the horizon, but does not rephase these mirror operators, uh, that this inequality would be violated uh, because rephasing the modes outside the horizon, but not the modes inside the horizon, uh, would lead to some phase factor of e to the i theta, uh, which means that the expectation value of the correlator would change at order one, and not in this small way, uh, as is expected by this inequality. And uh, I described a partial resolution to this, and the partial resolution to this was uh, that we restrict we restrict u to those excitations that can be obtained by uh, turning on a source dual to a local operator. Okay? So, you know, there are many ways you can act with, with unitaries. Uh, one thing you can do is, you know, you can just add some complicated operator with a delta function source at one point of time, or you can try and deform the Hamiltonian in this way. Uh, where you turn on some source which switches on at some point and switches off at some other point, or maybe, you know, it keeps going for some time. Uh, but at every point, you add to the Hamiltonian some operator Q of T, uh, and uh, this gives you some class of excitations uh, when Q of T is a simple operator. And if you restrict uh, these unitary excitations to excitations that can be obtained in this way, and secondly, you restrict the observables A that appear in this inequality, to being uh, products of field operators in a single causal patch, one causal patch, then this inequality is obeyed. So this is where we left off yesterday. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, some uh, partial resolution of uh, the fact that you know black holes look like they're violating if you believe this mirror operator construction and believe that uh, for typical states you should use these state dependent mirror operators uh, then it appears that black holes would violate this inequality and this is uh, an uh, a partial resolution that suggests that this violation will not be observed uh, will not be observable uh, but uh, we had some discussion about this yesterday uh, but I just want to emphasize some questions that at least I feel are unanswered, or at least uh, leave me with a, with a feeling that I think more needs to be understood. Uh, and uh, that is uh, the following. You see, earlier we had this definition of simple operators, uh, and I'm repeating some things that I said in the discussion yesterday. Uh, earlier we had this definition of simple operators that we were just considering uh, you know, limits where we are saying that simple operators were any low order polynomials in the modes. And from that point of view, it is clear, or, you know, it is at least uh, reasonably clear, uh, or one might at least argue that, you know, you should not expect the bulk theory to give you sensible answers if you start inserting very complicated operators, 
And at least certainly you should not expect bulk effective field theory to give you anything sensible if you start inserting operators where you know you have an order n squared polynomial of the modes. Uh, so you know it's reasonable to say that those kinds of questions uh, should just not be answerable by the bulk theory. Uh, but uh, here it seems that we are doing a little bit more, and that is that you know from the EFT point of view, we do consider operators like e to the i theta and w where this operator is a Schwarzschild number operator. Uh, and we do consider unitary excitations of this kind. And it's true that this unitary excitation cannot really be obtained by turning on a source dual to a local operator. As I emphasized yesterday, uh, this n of omega is a mode. So it involves an integral of an operator over a long time. And it's multiplied by the Hermitian conjugate of that mode. And uh, once you, you know, so uh, if you, you can't act with this operator at a single instant of time in any easy way, although from a mathematical point of view, in effective field theory, we do often consider these kinds of unitaries and you can do computations uh, with uh, these kinds of unitaries. And so the question is, uh, you know, why, uh, why does the bulk theory give unusual results if we consider such excitations? Uh, the same is true of uh, the observables that we discussed. Uh, as we were saying yesterday, uh, you know, we do often consider uh, excitations which are correlators which are outside a causal patch. Uh, and a simple example is, you know, uh, you just take a black hole geometry. Uh, here's a black hole. Let's just consider the future wedge of the black hole and just take some operator of this kind. So, you know, it's some operator that's not necessarily very close to the singularity, uh, but you could just consider the expectation value of an operator of this kind. And this operator is not in, the in any causal patch, but of course, bulk effective field theory would give you some, some prediction for that, which it's true that no single observer can measure. Uh, but, uh, you know, we could ask the same question uh, here, you know, why does bulk effective field theory uh, give unusual results for such, uh, for such unitaries? Uh, so the only thing I, I want to emphasize is that, you know, in with our earlier definition of simple that we had, where we were saying that uh, simple corresponds to, uh, uh, sorry, it got overwritten, but the question, I just copied the question above onto this correlator. Uh, you know, why is it that bulk effective field theory gives unusual results for such correlators? And, uh, uh, you know, with the earlier definition of, of simple, it was clear why bulk effective field theory breaks down. Uh, with this definition where we are saying, you know, uh, simple corresponds to what is observable by one observer, uh, it's, it's a slightly more complicated answer. At least one has to think a little bit more about this answer. And so it is, you know, it's not that in any obvious sense, back reaction or something is becoming large, uh, but we're saying that bulk effective field theory somehow only makes sense for these set of quantities that one observer can see and not for this larger set of quantities that you usually would uh, you know, would compute. And so I think at least that's something that that uh, needs a better, uh, better understanding. Uh, so I, when I at least uh, think about this issue, it seems to me that there are a few options. Um, you know, one option is that, uh, you know, uh, may, maybe this is just how it is. Okay, so maybe bulk EFT just gives good answers for observables, for observables, or for observable observables, okay, uh, things which a single observer can see, uh, and not for others. Okay. So, I mean, you can, you can compute it, but you would find these unusual results. You would find it would violate these bounds from statistical mechanics, but then you would say, well, you know, uh, that uh, no one is can actually observe that violation of the bound and maybe that's just uh, that's just how it is. So that's, of course, uh, one uh, one option. Uh, the uh, other option is, uh, and as I said, uh, you know, if one takes this option, one has to be careful. One has to check that, uh, you know, when one starts including gravitational effects and when, you know, the notion of a causal patch and other such things become uh, much less well defined because, you know, you lose the uh, notion of exact locality, as we have ourselves said many times in this course. 
uh, you would need to be careful about uh, this kind of an option. But fine, maybe that's a possibility. In fact, I think there is a second possibility. Uh, the second possibility is that, uh, you know, it may be that this computation we are doing is maybe the effect of these operators is more complicated than we think. So, you know, I said, and, and what that means is that, you know, I said that we compute this correlator psi a omega tilde a omega psi. You act on it with this e to the i theta n w. Right? You just act on it with e, e to the i theta n w. Uh, and uh, when you act on it with this factor of e to the i n theta n w, I said. Well, you know, this obviously just gives you a factor of e to the i theta, and then you get some other factors. But maybe this prediction is not correct. Okay. Maybe this is not correct. Uh, we don't know of any reason why this is not correct. And uh, I've certainly spent some amount of time trying to think about whether there might be some reason this is not correct. Uh, but it might be that, you know, the action of such operators is more subtle. And we need to think more carefully about this. And it has sometimes happened uh, that, you know, correlators where one thought that back reaction was small and one could just compute something using free field theory. I mean, the computation we've done here is effectively a free field computation uh, somehow breaks down. And so I think this is a possibility that, that one, should, one should think about. Uh, so that's, that's a, a possibility. And of course, there's a third possibility, which is that uh, maybe uh, state dependence is just wrong. Uh, so that's that's a possibility, you know, maybe what this paradox is telling us is that uh, state dependence uh, is just wrong and, uh, you know, typical states have firewalls. Even if state dependence is wrong, uh, the mirror operator construction that we defined would still be correct, but it would be correct for those states which have a smooth horizon. Okay? So mirror operators are still correct for a class of states, this class of states being the ones that have a smooth horizon, but not correct otherwise. So that's uh, a possibility, uh, which uh, I mean, which uh, we should uh, also consider. Uh, and as we said, uh, you know, the, the difficulty with this uh, possibility uh, is uh, that this also tells you that the eternal black hole geometry has a problem. Uh, so it also implies that the eternal BH has a problem. Okay? So it is not just that, you know, we think that uh, the large black holes or typical states in large black holes have a problem because, uh, you know, one might be willing to live with that because no one ever a uh, dozen e-computations with typical states. And one could say, you know, where there's some special states where you create a black hole from collapse and those states clearly have smooth horizons. Uh, but really, uh, you know, to go to a typical state, you need to wait for a very long time or you need to manipulate the black hole for a very long time. And maybe in that very long time, uh, you somehow develop a firewall. And so people, uh, you know, that might be a possibility. Uh, but uh, what uh, the paradox with the eternal black hole tells us is that we can't, uh, just that's not an easy way out because even the eternal black hole geometry, which we feel we have verified and you know done many calculations with, uh, will have a problem because even in that geometry, uh, we get the same paradoxes and we again need state dependence uh, to resolve them. So this is something I, I want to underline. You know, if if you accept this possibility that state dependence is wrong, uh, you're forced uh, to also accept that there has to be an issue with the eternal black hole. Okay? Uh, so the, there are these possibilities, and uh, I actually, uh, uh, I, you know, it's, it's I think, uh, an interesting open question uh, on which there was some activity some time back, but uh, it's something which I think is unresolved. Uh, but I think uh, it's, uh, you know, it's something which uh, deserves more attention. And I just wanted to say that uh, there has been, uh, as I said in the literature, uh, the various attitudes that people will take towards state dependence, but I think that this particular paradox that we are discussing, this, this Born rule paradox or this Born rule 
low energy paradox. Uh, uh, that this paradox or this puzzle is uh, is the key to understanding this issue. At least is is a key issue. So uh, I don't have anything more uh, to say about this uh, than what I've said. I think I've summarized uh, what is currently understood about these issues. Uh, and as I said, uh, it leaves us with some open options. Maybe there are other open options that, uh, uh, I, that we haven't thought of. Uh, and, uh, but in any case, at least it seems to me that uh, this issue or this, this puzzle is something that uh, deserves the greater attention. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a better understanding of this uh, in some time or in, 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 in the future. Okay, uh, so that's one thing I wanted to say to complete the, the discussion from yesterday. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So there was a question, right? Sorry, uh, I was saying, I'm not sure that I understood well your third point about this independence is wrong. In that case, you're saying that um, it was say set fireworks, and so even small excitation would drive away from particular states like a black hole creating a state of firewall. Is that the idea? Sorry, sorry, I was not able to hear you clearly. Could you please say it once more? Yeah. Oh, I said, I'm not sure that I understood. Can you hear me? You're not sure that you understood? Uh, yeah, yeah, so point three, just because, um, so you're saying that typical states have firewalls. And so if you take a, a particular state like a black hole and you consider a small excitation, you would end up in a state with a firewall. And why does that imply that state dependence is wrong? Well, uh, sorry, so I, it was more the other way around. You know, maybe this this paradox. So I was just saying, maybe this puzzle tells us uh, that state dependence is wrong. If it does, then you see, if state dependence is wrong, then well, okay, we don't know of any other way to to construct interior operators without state dependence. So these paradoxes tell us that there is no state independent construction of the interior operators. So if if uh, if state dependence is wrong, uh, then it would suggest that uh, typical states have firewalls. So you know. Uh, maybe there's uh, so I, I was about I'm going to say a little bit more about that about uh, but the paradoxes I think are pretty robust in that if you use a state independent operator uh, uh, one cannot construct like interiors uh, you know, th there's no state independent interior operator that gives you the correct predictions of bulk effective field theory and so that's why I was saying that if if the state dependent construction is wrong uh, then the alternative is that typical states have uh, firewalls. Uh, and maybe this puzzle is telling us that, you know, the state dependent interior construction suffers from these problems. And uh, so maybe it's not, it's not correct. I mean, this is not what, what I would like to, what I would like to believe, but I think it's a possibility which uh, one, one should, one should consider. So, I mean, just in the spirit of being unbiased, if you were to ask me what I think is the answer, I don't think this is the answer, but in the spirit of being unbiased, I think this is a, a possibility. And some people uh, do believe that this is the right possibility and typical states have firewalls uh, because, uh, there's no state independent interior operator that can be constructed. Of course, there's a possibility that, you know, uh, a state dependence is wrong and we've also missed something in the paradoxes. Uh, so maybe there's an additional resolution, some other resolution which does not use state dependence. Uh, but if so, we don't know what that resolution is either. So you know, there's of course for just something else. I don't know if that answered the question or if, if it did. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. And, and sorry, I, I have a question as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I would be fairly happy with option one, uh, but that also, even if we accept option one, that wouldn't answer the question about why are black holes so sensitive to uh, low energy excita excitations? Well, with, within the set of observable observables, they are not sensitive to low energy excitations. So yeah. if you so if you restrict this this uh, if you restrict to this set of observable observables so that's what I was saying here uh, then they are not sensitive so you know if you say that that's all I can compute with bulk effective field theory that whatever one observer can observe then you don't have this sensitivity so it makes the sensitivity go away. But is is it not correct that you you would like to also know why they are sensitive to uh excitations that are non-observable yes i agree so so that that's that that's why that's why I, I said that this is a you know 
it's a it's a vaguely unsatisfying thing right because okay. uh, 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 so if you look at option one you know you're right i mean that's that's i, I agree uh, which is which is precisely this right so we do consider and, and wh why does the bulk theory give unusual results for such unit trees exactly so i i agree and and that's something uh, you know you can say you can't observe it but you know what does that mean does that mean you should not use the bulk theory for such computations or you know, and, and if so, why, why shouldn't you use it? So I, I agree that that's why this is a partial resolution. Okay, thank you. I, I understand. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so uh, uh, let, let me say a few, a few other things. Uh, so you see uh, one, uh, maybe just related to what we were discussing now, uh, one might uh, wonder if there's some other construction that we can find. So, you know, could there be another interior construction which kind of avoids these problems. Uh, so, you know, it somehow resolves the paradoxes. It has the same nice features, but it, uh, it uh, resolves, you know, it somehow avoids these problems. Uh, but the point is that, you know, if you look back at the definition of the mirror operators, uh, the action of the mirror operators within Etsy, within the little Hilbert space, is just fixed by effective field theory, right? So if one has another construction, so any other, other interior construction must agree with this, must agree with this mirror construction within the little Hilbert space, at least. So what that means is that, you know, this, this mirror construction doesn't tell you what happens if you compute some very complicated correlators, uh, what happens if you go beyond this little Hilbert space. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it could be that if you have some other construction that gives you a more complete answer that also tells you what will happen beyond the little Hilbert space, but uh, the, the mirror operators were defined uh, so that you just, had to have, you know, any other construction has to have the same correlators that the mirror operators do. And the action of the mirror operators in this little Hilbert space was just completely fixed by effective field theory. So it just has to be the case that if there's some other construction and if it is correct, then it must agree with this mirror construction within its side. Okay? And it can disagree outside its side, but not within the little Hilbert space. And I feel that, uh, you know, uh, when one, uh, so th there have been uh, other proposals, uh, to construct uh, the interior. And I feel that uh, there are the following tests, which I, at least I find useful as a rule of thumb uh, to check, uh, you know, what happens if you do these other, if you can counter another construction. And uh, one of them is, uh, of course, the other construction should be, you know, if it's precise enough uh, to yield uh, some operators and some correlators, uh, then one question one can ask is, you know, you have to ensure that the commutator with simple operators outside vanishes. So, you know, you, you have to make sure that you're not somehow violating this property. So, must have a small commutator with operators outside. And this is something that I find that sometimes people don't check carefully and that, you know, one writes down a construction and one has to ensure that this mirror operator that you obtain or this, this interior operator that one obtains uh, does have a small commutator with operators outside. And if it doesn't, uh, you would just end up violating locality because you would measure some commutator of some operator inside and outside, and you would get an order one uh, correlator. So, you know, maybe if this commutator is one over n or it's suppressed in some way, uh, that's acceptable. Uh, but if you, if you find that this commutator is order one, then that's something that would lead to trouble. Uh, the second thing which I find uh, is sometimes uh, not taken care of is about the right commutators with the Hamiltonian. So uh, as I, as we explained a few times, you know, uh, it is, it is sometimes still, still mentioned, or at least it, it was earlier believed that the right construction, you know, of these interior operators should be in the eternal black hole should be that you just take the left operators, the operators from the, the left CFT, but that is not correct because one does need to ensure that these things have the right, uh, if, if you dress them to the right boundary, they have the right commutators with the Hamiltonian. And in fact, if you were to forget about this constraint and you were to, you know, say, well, I don't mind, I'll just take A omega L, 
uh, then uh, you would in fact not have these paradoxes, but also you would get unusual predictions in that you would find that these time shifted eternal black hole states uh, don't behave correctly. And uh, so you would find some you know, problems if you try to look at time shifted states. And so it's important that these mirror operators do have the right commutators with the Hamiltonian. And this right commutator in some sense is a wrong sign commutator. You know, it's the fact that even though this is an annihilation operator, uh, it has positive energy. And that's something that you just need to ensure. Okay. Uh, the third criteria, of course, one should check uh, is uh, the criteria of the frozen vacuum. And so it's important that, you know, if you act on a non, on some near equilibrium operator, that you should have this, this behavior. In fact, if one, again, if one drops this kind of, uh, of, uh, of a demand and ones uh, where this unitary operator is the thing that strips off the excitation from this near equilibrium operator. And this U inserts it back. We discussed this in some detail when we discussed near equilibrium states. Uh, but once again, you know, if you drop this demand or you, you, know, you come up with a construction that doesn't satisfy this, uh, then you know, it, it may be possible to, to uh, you know, uh, not have something that's state dependent, but it would run into problems with the, the frozen vacuum. So, so this is the issue of the frozen vacuum. So I'm just giving you a list of things that I think uh, constructions have to satisfy. And the last thing is that, uh, you know, one has to make sure that the constructions work on generic states. Uh, in particular, you know, if there's a proposal and the proposal doesn't explain how the interior reconstruction works in generic states, then it doesn't help answer at least one of the questions we've been trying to answer, which is, you know, how do, do typical states have a description, have a good description in the boundary theory or not? So uh, we need to know how the interior construction acts on, on generic states. In fact, it is possible, it is of course possible, so it is possible to have alternate constructions. That disagree. That disagree outside at psi. And as I said, it's also possible to have constructions that disagree on generic states. You see, you might say that that on generic states, the mirror operator construction is uh, is not correct. And if you were to say that, then you would end up. Uh, if, if, if you were to say that, you would end up with the, the prediction that for generic states, you have a firewall or some kind of structure on the horizon. Uh, so it is, of course, possible uh, to come up with an alternate construction, uh, which uh, you know, disagrees, first of all, outside this little Hilbert space, because the mirror operators are not even defined outside the little Hilbert space, and which you know, disagrees on generic states. So uh, this is the possibility that we defined previously, we considered previously, which is the possibility that generic states have structure at the horizon. So at least four states which have a smooth horizon uh, within the little Hilbert space, any other alternate construction must agree with the mirror operators. And the place where you have freedom is how things behave within complicated correlators. And you have some freedom on how something behaves on generic states. And the freedom that you have is that you know you you can uh, you, it's there's nothing mathematically inconsistent with the interior construction uh, that's, that, you know, that, that states that generic states have structured the horizon. And if so, it would disagree with the state dependent construction. Uh, but even then it would have to agree with this mirror operator construction on states that are smooth at the horizon. Um, okay, uh, so that's uh, uh, a second point which I, I wanted to make. And I think these are just useful rules of thumb uh, because the black hole interior is a topic that is discussed often, and I think uh, it's useful to evaluate uh, discussions of the interior uh, using the scale, or at least I find it useful often to evaluate uh, constructions of the interior using uh, these kinds of, this kind of a checklist. Um, okay, uh, let me say uh, one more thing. Uh, as I said, I'm going through a set of uh, roughly miscellaneous topics. And uh, the other example, uh, the other point I want to make, which is, uh, which I guess we didn't discuss, is about state dependence elsewhere in ads -CFD. So in fact, the black hole interior is not the only example where we see state dependence uh, in ads -CFD. Uh, We see state dependence come up also in other examples in ads -CFD. 
And uh, so, you know, that's uh, one reason why one might think that state dependence appears to be some kind of feature of ads -CFT. And uh, one uh, example where state dependence uh, just appears and is just, just obviously present uh, is the uh, holographic entanglement formula. So the Ryu Takinagi formula. So why do I say that this is state dependent? Uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, remember that the Ryu Takinagi formula tells you that the entropy is given by the area over 4G Newton. Now on the right hand side, uh, we have an observable. So at least one thinks it should be an observable. An observable in the bulk in that, you know, if you had a set of bulk observers, uh, they could go and they could measure the metric at different points and they could also measure the area of the minimal surface. And so you do expect that what you have on the right hand side is a good geometric quantity, uh, precisely of the kind or at least of the same flavor of the kind that we have been asking previously where we've been asking questions about the area where we've been asking questions about the correlators or fields, uh, which are good bulk observables and the same way this is a good in fact a good classical bulk observable. Uh, on the right hand side. But on the left hand side, uh, the entanglement entropy, S is not the expectation value of any observable. Uh, so let me just explain why uh, this is the case. Perhaps this is already clear to clear to some of you. Uh, but let me just uh, uh, remind you why uh, the entanglement entropy is not the expectation value of any observable. Uh, so we'll do a proof by contradiction. Uh, say that S of psi, so the entanglement, so let's, let's say that we have a direct product Hilbert space, which is H1 times H2, which is the sense in which, which is the context in which the entanglement entropy makes sense. And uh, let's say we have some state psi and uh, in that state psi, you know, we look at the reduced density matrix on the state two uh, on the hill on the system two. And we ask if it's asked for its entanglement entropy. And let us say this entanglement entropy is the expectation value of some observable, which I'm calling X. Okay. Now, what do we know about this observable X? Uh, you know, we know that for any state, S of psi is uh, is always uh, you know is is always non-negative, and so we know that all the eigenvalues of this observable are also non-negative, right? It must be the case uh, because there is no state uh, for which X is, uh, uh, for which X ever gives an, a negative value. If there was such a state, uh, then, you know, S of Psi for that would be negative. And that we know is not allowed because the entanglement entropy is something that's always positive. And so, you know, we know that all eigenvalues of this operator X must be, must be positive. Uh, but now let us choose a basis for H1 times H2. And the basis I'll choose is a disentangled basis. Notice that disentangled states always form a basis for the Hilbert space. You know, when I have an EPR pair, I can always choose a basis for the Hilbert space, which is totally disentangled, you know, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0. And that's a basis uh, for the Hilbert space. And it's completely disentangled. And now we know that for this basis, S of ij is equal to zero. And so it is the case that ij x ij is equal to zero. And so we know that the trace of x is zero because x is zero for all elements in the basis. But we also know that all its eigenvalues, right? So we know the trace of x is equal to zero. And we know that all its eigenvalues are non-negative. And the only way that can happen is if X itself is zero. Uh, and that would mean that S is zero, uh, which is clearly absurd. 
So it is not possible for the entanglement entropy to be the expectation value of any operator. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a function on the Hilbert space. So it's a function of correlation functions, uh, but the entanglement entropy is not the expectation value of any operator. Uh, alternately said, you know, if you think of the entanglement entropy as the expectation value sometimes of the modular operator, you know, uh, then uh, uh, this or the, of, uh, you know, uh, log, log of rho, uh, then uh, this uh, operator is a state dependent operator of precisely the kind that we have been discussing previously. Uh, so this is another example uh, where uh, you see it's the simplest example uh, where one sees state dependence uh, crop up elsewhere in ADS-CFT. Uh, this is of course something that's used, uh, you know, extensively, the Ryu Takinagi formula is used extensively, uh, but it has not been investigated whether this kind of state dependence uh, leads to significant effects or significant observable effects of the kind that we have been discussing. Uh, but I think the fact that, you know, uh, this is something that again, uh, should be understood better. Uh, one can show, and it has been shown, uh, that if you take small superpositions of states, so you take the little Hilbert space, uh, then of course you don't see these issues. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, these are uh, the entanglement entropy uh, for a superposition of states uh, behaves just like a linear operator would. Uh, but we have a proof that says that it cannot behave like a linear operator for all states. And uh, the consequences of this have not been, uh, I think, investigated uh, entirely. Uh, although we do understand that, you know, this doesn't lead to any significant problems if you just take the, the little Hilbert space, which of course is a basic consistency requirement. And it also doesn't lead to significant problems if you take small superpositions of states, uh, but whether it could lead to significant observable effects elsewhere uh, has not been investigated. Uh, there are other examples uh, of this kind which appear, for instance, you know, there are questions about whether the topology of the space time is given by a linear operator. And there's an argument that, that also is not given by a single state independent operator. Uh, so I think the issue of state dependence is something that uh, does crop up in many places in ADS CFT. And uh, as I said, I think this bond rule issue is a key issue that needs to be understood to see if this is completely consistent or not. And so I think this is an interesting open question, uh, which uh, hopefully uh, we'll make some progress on in the future. Um, good. Uh, are there any questions about this? I'll, I, otherwise, I'll move on to a different topic. Uh, is there a question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Sorry. Can yeah. you repeat why the fact that the entanglement expectation value relates to how it relates with the state state dependence? So on the so on the left hand side, uh, we have here. Uh, this is a state dependent operator, right? Because this is not a state independent operator. So the question is, how do we interpret uh, uh, the entanglement entropy is, is zero? So on the right-hand side, we have an observable. So this is something which relates something on the boundary to something in the bulk, which is the, the same kind of question we were asking earlier, right? We had some bulk quantity, which was like maybe a bulk correlator of fields, and we expect it to be a good observable. Uh, and that's the same formula we have here. We have something in the boundary CFT, uh, and we have something in the bulk. Uh, on the bulk, we expect the area to be an observable in that it should be a state independent operator, or at least we naively expect, in the sense that, you know, there should be uh, some uh, projector or some Hermitian operator in the bulk theory that corresponds to the area, uh, or at least we would naively expect that. Uh, and so uh, on the left-hand side, we now have uh, this entanglement entropy, uh, but it's not the expectation value. There's no operator on the boundary, so that S is the expectation value of that operator. Uh, so uh, if you interpret the right-hand side as being the expectation value of the Hermitian of some Hermitian operator in the bulk, then there is no Hermitian operator on the left-hand side so that uh, S is the expectation value of an operator on the boundary. So, you know, this, this uh, relation we have cannot be interpreted as some X boundary is equal to X bulk. So no interpretation of the form. Uh, at least provided that this X, you know, where both X boundary and X bulk are state independent operators. So that's what we just showed that uh, the Ryu Takenagi formula does not permit an interpretation of this kind. Uh, if you take like, you know, X boundary to be a state dependent operator and that you say that, you know, X boundary is not the same all over the Hilbert space. It's some nonlinear operator, or, you know, it changes, it behaves linearly for small superpositions or, you know, in the neighborhood of some state, but doesn't behave linearly if you go to a very different uh, uh, state. Uh, then of course, uh, you know, this formula would hold. Uh, but if you demand that X boundary is a linear operator in the whole Hilbert space, then there is no interpretation of this kind possible for the formula. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you.
Um, I have a question. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, I'm not audible, right? Uh, yeah, I, I can't hear. Actually, I can hear Tamir. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, is it is it very faint or, uh, or is it, uh, sorry? Hello. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear ha, you. Ha, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so what's the point here that we can always construct? Uh, we can always have a basis uh, in which all, all the states are individually disentangled. Uh, I see. I see. Okay. So you can always have a basis, and that basis tells you that the entanglement entropy is not the expectation value of any operator. You know, so so this is what we are trying to prove. We are trying to prove that S is not the expectation value of any observer. Uh, and uh, the way the proof goes is that you know if it was the expectation value, that observable would have to be positive. So let's say it was, then this observable would have to be positive. And you can always choose a basis which is disentangled. The observable is zero on that basis. It's positive, so it must be zero everywhere. Right. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I have one one question about this. Yeah. Uh, RD formula. So left hand side is a com is completely we know that it's it's a state dependent operator, right? And from the contradiction we have just right now, right? But but right the right hand side is expected to have a, a state independent thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So how how does this RT formula uh, get around this uh, conflict of state dependence? I mean, no, no. Uh, on both sides. That the, the, it's the, when you say the right hand side is expected to be state independent, that's that's an expectation. Uh, uh, the point is that you know there are geometric quantities like the area or maybe like correlators in the bulk or field operators in the bulk, which maybe need to be mapped to the boundary in some state dependent way. Uh, so that's what we were saying earlier. You know, earlier as well, we had some field operator or some mode that in the bulk you might have thought is just an operator, right? It's just a field at some point. And so why should this be state dependent? It's just some observable. But you found that when you tried to map it to the boundary, or you tried to find an operator on the boundary that that had this uh, uh, that that you know mapped to this bulk operator, it had to be state dependent. So or what I'm saying is, we are finding the same phenomena happening here as well. That you have something that you might have naively or you might have expected to be state independent, but uh, you find that there's no state independent operator on the boundary, and so it's it's this you know it's a similar example to what we see for the mirror operators. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying some things, you know, I, I'm not even giving you like very clear answers to these things. So since this is the last lecture, I'm just kind of uh, making some observations. Uh, this is not something that's completely understood, neither is what I said previously. Uh, so these are just some observations that I think are interesting. Uh, and uh, I'm not, uh, these stories are not uh, completely cleared up. So, you know, maybe one of you will clear this up completely, but yeah. Uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry yeah. Could I, can I ask one question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, this um, why why does the area have to be uh, a single operator? I mean, could it it could also be some uh, something more general, right? Some of some of operators or something. I mean, why why does it have to come? Uh, some of operators is still an operator, so it. I mean, why does it have to have to um, uh, match match to an expectation value of a of a single operator? Uh, it's guess. a metric, right? In if you had if you did bulk effective field theory or you had a G mu nu. Uh, right. Then uh, this is an it's some it's some expectation value of of some of some single operator. It's some it's some expectation value. I mean, uh, so this area is a classical quantity, but I'm interpreting it as an expectation value. Uh, but it's the interpret it's it's integral of you know uh, the induced metric integrated over over the the Ryu Takenagi surface, uh, and uh, that induced metric. So uh, you have to explain what that means in the quantum theory. But if you just take that as an expectation value. You know, this right. area is just like it's just some integral of some induced metric, right? Right, right. But uh, so or... this is what it is classically. So quantum mechanically, I'm saying, well, let me just interpret it this way. But uh, but over the surface that uh, um, um, right. I mean, it's it's it, parts of the surface are, are spaced like could be spaced like each other, right? Yeah, they could and be that's... spaced like, but it's it's a metric. I mean, you know. If I have a geodesic distance, it that's a that's a you know that's an in the quantum theory it is an expectation value of the metric, right? right or sure. This is the area. So whether it's space like or time like or whatever, you know, if the metric is an operator or is a state independent operator, then the area is a state independent operator. So hmm. so there's no, I mean, uh, yeah, it, we are finding some subtlety, but otherwise, if you just did you know effective field theory in flat space or something, the area would just be a state independent operator. It would clearly be an observable. Right, right. 
it's as observable as the metric is. Right. But then, then as it is being pointed out, it still runs into conflict that 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 the other other side is state dependent. Well, it's the same conflict that that we are finding earlier. You know, earlier we found that right, right. high effects on in the bulk, and uh, we had like a state some state dependent operator in the boundary, right? So phi CFT was state dependent. So I'm just pointing out that this feature appears in more than one place. I mean, this is what we were discussing earlier in the state dependent right, discussion. Right, right. We had we had a field in the bulk, and we found that you know there's something on the boundary that was state dependent. Right, 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 right. Okay, thanks. Fine. Uh, good. Uh, so now I want to say I, I want to end uh, or say one last thing about uh, do typical states have structure? So in the lecture notes, uh, there's in fact um, a, a section on this, uh, but really there's that section is just summarizing various things. Uh, so we've already said uh, everything, almost everything that we want to say. I just wanted to clear up a few things. In fact, some of it already appeared in the discussion yesterday. Uh, so uh, do typical states have structure at the horizon? So this is uh, an interesting question. It's it's the question that we've basically been discussing, uh, you know, uh, which is that do typical states just have an empty horizon or do they have structure at the horizon? Uh, so let me just remind you of uh, what we have discussed so far. Uh, and let me also just uh, say some things about how this question is sometimes phrased in the literature. So, you know, what is it that we, we really, uh, you know, what, what would be a good answer to this question? So what would be a good answer to this question is that we compute using the, the standard solution, black hole solution. We compute some Green's function And this is a computation that one can do, right? We have computed two point functions, but one could compute three point functions and so on. And so one could compute uh, such uh, a function. And then uh, the question is, uh, you know, is it the case that, you know, when you do a, a mapping of the bulk to the boundary, is it the case that in a typical state psi, If you compute, if you find some representation of these bulk operators as CFT operators, is it the case that you, when you compute this correlation function, do you get this answer or not? Okay. So let's call this the expected answer. So this is the really the question. Uh, and, and the reason this is the question is, you know, you could compute if you had structured the horizon, then you can always detect such structure by means of a two-point correlation function. And uh, you can just compute two-point correlation function across the horizon. And if you have structure, you will see a difference. And otherwise, you will not see a difference. And so the point is, you know, there is some expected answer which you can compute unambiguously just using bulk effective field theory about the standard Schwarzschild solution. So you have some answer. And then uh, you have some CFT operators, and you say these CFT operators are these bulk operators and then you can insert them in a typical state and in principle the cft should give you an answer and should tell you do typical states have a horizon or, or you know do they have a smooth horizon or do they not uh, the question that we have been addressing is slightly different okay? uh, so the question we've been addressing is do there exist phi cft xi with the property such that in typical psi so this is the question that we have been addressing in some sense and this is a slightly different question from the question that we were asking previously because previously we were saying you know let's say there is some correct mapping of the bulk to the boundary that we know from something else you can then insert this product of fields into a typical state and you can ask what's the correlator you get. Uh, so here we are saying, well, we don't know a priori what the correct mapping from the boundary to the bulk is, but at least we can ask an existence question. Do there even exist CFT operators that could have the right Green's functions? And you know, if you were to first encounter this question, or at least when I first encountered this question, I thought, well, you know, obviously there must exist because you can always hook up 
an operator to have whatever correlators you like. Uh, but as these paradoxes show, uh, even cooking up an operator to have the right correlators is hard. And in fact, the answer to this that we, we've been discussing is that the answer is that yes, if we allow this phi CFT to be state dependent and no otherwise. And uh, notice that this, this question is not quite the same as the question I had previously, which was, you know, uh, you find some a priori mapping of the bulk to the boundary, and then you just insert those CFT operators. So it's not the same because even if there exist some operators that give you the right correlators, maybe those operators are not the right ones to use. So, you know, one attitude one could take is, you know, if these operators give you the right correlators that you expect from effective field theory, we will just declare that that's the correct bulk to boundary mapping, which is the attitude that, you know, I was tacitly taking in the past couple of lectures. But in principle, you might say, well, even if you can find such operators, they are not the right operators to use for some other reason. And uh, so, you know, that's why uh, you shouldn't uh, use these operators. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's what I want to point out now is that there's a slightly less ambitious question which can ask, which one can ask, which is just an existence question. And even this existence question is subtle in that such operators exist only if you allow things to be state dependent and they do not exist uh, otherwise. And uh, as I emphasized, uh, you can ask the same question. Question can be asked in the eternal black hole. In the eternal black hole. And there the question is not about typical states, uh, but it is about, you know, do there exist operators? Do there exist some phi CFT XI? So that in these time shifted states, where these states are the time shifted states, so thermal field state evolved with time t, that they give you the expected answer. Okay. And the answer is the same. You know, yes, if you allow state dependent operators and no otherwise. And of course, if the answer, therefore, if the answer is, you know, that we don't allow state uh, dependent operators, and as I said previously, uh, you know, one runs into, uh, uh, one is forced to uh, then say that even the eternal black hole has some structure or somehow the solution that we are considering uh, needs to be embellished in some way. And it's not just the eternal black hole, but what's dual to the thermal field double state is something more subtle. Okay. Uh, so would, would you also say that once you consider the Euclidean version of the CFT, these operators should somehow become trivial? Yeah, in the Euclidean version of CFT, this, this issue never occurs because in the Euclidean theory, you're only looking at the exterior. So right. there, hence, hence from the, the field theory construction should somehow become trivial? Uh, the field theory construction should somehow become trivial. Is, I mean, the interior just doesn't, just doesn't continue in some nice way. I mean, the Euclidean theory, this just doesn't exist, right? So when you say the field so theory- From the bulk, like you, when you say that you mean in the bulk, there is no interior. Is that what- that's what that's you right. mean. That's the so, yeah, so, so I'm just saying, what is the, uh, even if you construct such operators in the CFT, once they consider the Euclidean version, I'm, I'm just asking what, what, what do they become like? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what would such operators mean if you, I mean, if, if you were to take these correlators and, and continue them in some, in some way? Um, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I don't they know. They have to somehow mean. become trivial, right? Like, and. Uh, perhaps, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what a good answer to that question is. I mean, uh, so it, there, there's some, yeah. We, you know, we don't know in general how to construct such operators. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to do some Euclidean continuation or continuation from the Lorentzian to the Euclidean case, uh, you would have to have some uh, very general understanding of these operators, which I don't think we have. So, I don't know what a good answer to that question is. Yeah, in some sense, you're right. They should become trivial, but but yeah. Can you clarify what you mean that the Euclidean case are sound here? So maybe there's some problem in the audio again. Sorry, could you see it? Say it once again, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, I asked if you can clarify what uh, what you mean when you say that in the Euclidean case there is no interior. Uh, yeah, I, I was just saying in the Euclidean case, uh, it, it uh, you know, there's no interior. So I, I thought the question was, is there some, you know, is there, some, if you were to construct such operators, is there some expectation that you have if you take these correlators and continue them to the Euclidean theory? Do we have any expectation there? 
or is there some Euclidean version of this, you know, this question we can ask? Is there some Euclidean test to ask if there is a smooth structure at the horizon? And as far as I know, there is not. There's no good uh, a Euclidean test uh, to ask if there's structure at the horizon. And if one takes these interior correlators and, and tries to continue them in some way to the Euclidean theory, you know, if one were to find some CFT operators that once declares are interior operators and continues them to the Euclidean theory, uh, then uh, in, you know, the interior doesn't exist in the bulk. So uh, it's not clear what would happen to those operators. Yeah, sorry, the question was, uh, in what sense the interior doesn't exist at all in Euclidean signature? Uh, just because the interior pinches off in the Euclidean theory, it's so in the Euclidean theory. You know, you have you have you have the cigar geometry in the bulk, and so in that sense, uh, you would expect that if the interior, you know, the bulk geometry continues to the cigar geometry, uh, then there is no inside of the horizon. Just in that sense. Uh, okay, uh, let, let me say well. One more thing uh, in this in this uh, scattered list, uh, which is about uh, you know uh, you could ask the same question about uh, flat space black holes. In fact, we already discussed this yesterday. So you know, is there such a problem also about uh, flat space black holes? Uh, in so for flat space black holes, uh, one doesn't run into these paradoxes as we are saying in the discussion yesterday. Uh, so flat space black holes do not suffer. From these problems, uh, or at least we don't know. Uh, let, let me raise this. I'll write, write a more precise statement later. Uh, uh, let, let me say a few things about flat space black holes. You know, uh, in the case of flat space black holes, we find that the entropy of the black hole is always smaller than the entropy of the Hawking radiation, and the reason for I mean, that's the reason flat space black holes evaporate. Uh, because uh, uh, at the same at the same energy, the Hawking radiation has more entropy, and that's why flat space black holes evaporate. Uh, whereas this is not true in the case of large ADS black holes. Large ADS black holes are thermodynamically stable, and therefore, uh, you know, flat space black holes are exponentially atypical states. So in flat space, are exponentially atypical states. Now. Let me remind you that for such states, the paradoxes that we had previously uh, do not occur because the paradoxes that we had previously all arose because one took some trace over the Hilbert space. And uh, you know, here one can't take a trace over the microcanonical space and expect that trace to be only running over black hole states uh, because if one takes a trace over states with a given energy, uh, that state uh, is mostly running over states which are just a gas of gravitons and photons and other particles and not running largely over the space of black holes and black holes are giving only exponentially small contributions uh, to traces. Okay. So there's another way to say, say this, uh, the fact that the paradoxes don't exist. You see, let us say you were to say psi one was, was a flat space microstate, right? then you might construct, you might do this mirror operator construction and you might find some operator which I'll call A omega psi one, which works on this little Hilbert space H psi one, right? So we could construct such an operator even in flat space. Uh, you could construct a little Hilbert space about this microstate. We don't know how to characterize such a microstate, but let's say somebody came and told us that, look, uh, psi one is a flat space microstate, then I could construct this kind of a mirror operator on the little Hilbert space. And similarly about other microstates, I could construct this operator A omega tilde psi i. Okay. Now, I, uh, we explain that in ADS, if you try to sum these operators and construct some state independent operator, then such a sum would not work because the cross terms, you know, when you inserted this in some state, you would get cross terms. So let's say you try to insert this back in the state psi one, you would get cross terms from the parts of the sum that run from two to e to the s. And those cross terms would be small, but because there are so many terms, so many of these operators, uh, those cross terms would mess up the correlator or could mess up the correlator of this a tilde omega, even 
within one of the original microstates that you started with. But in flat space, uh, this is not so clear. And this is not so clear because the cross terms. So if you if you write this as psi one a omega tilde psi one, this one of course gives us the correct correlator we want. And then you have something else, which is something that you don't want. And you have a sum over i equal to two to e to the s, and uh, you have this kind of a sum. But now notice these microstates, all of these microstates psi i, are living in a Hilbert space which has size, or at least an effective Hilbert space which has size at least e to the s Hawking radiation. So psi i are all living in a Hilbert space which has this effective dimension. And so the cross terms here might be suppressed by e to the s Hawking radiation. You have to be careful about which e to the s you're summing over. Here you're summing over the black hole entropy. And here this cross term might be suppressed by e to the minus of s Hawking radiation. Okay, so it might be that this term is suppressed by e to the minus of s Hawking radiation. And so even though you're summing over many terms which have as much as the black hole entropy, it might be that such an operator gives you a state independent notion of an interior operator in flat space. Okay. So we may be able to construct, so we may be able to construct state independent operators, interior operators in flat space. Okay. I emphasize me because you know we no one has ever thought about this question very carefully, and the reason no one has ever thought about this question very carefully is uh, you know we don't have a good characterization of black hole microstates in flat space, and so you know uh, it, it could be there's no obvious paradox, uh, but it may be that uh, we can find a state independent operators. So I think the precise statement, which is the statement I should have written in the in the beginning, is that no currently known paradox requires flat space black holes to have structure. It may be that we, we find such a paradox, uh, but it may be that, you know, flat space black holes, uh, there is just no such paradox. And of course, I remind you that, you know, it's not that there are no paradoxes for flat space black holes. We spent uh, the first two thirds of this course discussing uh, paradoxes for flat space black holes. And uh, so, you know, there is, there is uh, the monogamy paradox. Uh, there is there are the paradoxes with the principle of ignorance. There's Hawking's original paradox, but these paradoxes are all resolved by this principle, by the holography of information. And if one, when one realizes that, you know, gravity stores information unusually, uh, and, you know, information at one point might be available in the region around that point, then one is able to resolve these paradoxes. And these paradoxes don't, you know, this resolution does not by itself require state dependence. Uh, this issue of state dependence is something that should be separated from the paradoxes that apply to flat space black holes. So I think this is, an important point, which is that you know there are different kinds of paradoxes. Not all of them require state dependence. Uh, you know uh, the paradoxes in flat space have a nice resolution via this holography of information, and uh, the paradoxes for evaporating black holes uh, also have such a resolution, even in ADS. If you look at small black holes, and uh, these paradoxes that afflict large black holes uh, do not necessarily afflict flat space black holes. And I emphasize that do not necessarily afflict, and the fact that you know, and we're talking about what is currently known, it may be that you know, we find something in the future which tells us that even for flat space black holes, uh, we have this issue of state dependence. Um, I actually I said this in the discussion yesterday, but I just thought I would I would repeat it more systematically. So could I do something similar in ADS or black holes also where if you couple a larger system to the CFT or something? and then make a similar statement that yeah. then you can have a yeah yeah but you know if you couple it to a larger system you you then need yeah so what is the, the question one is asking is one asking a question about 
typical states in the larger system, then of course, you know, those states are not, are not black holes at all. Right? No, just that you couple a larger system to the CFT and then claim that you can probably yes, construct but, interior state dependent. Yeah, good, good. So if you construct a yeah, good, good, but you know, the, the, the uh, right. So, uh, uh, you know, just adding a Hilbert space, which is just a spectator doesn't help. You know, what's important here is that uh, these, you know, if you look at the black hole, different black hole microstates, they should have an inner product that's suppressed by this larger Hilbert space. So if you just take the CFT and you just add like a system, uh, you know, what is what was important here is that the different black hole microstates might have an inner product that's suppressed. Uh, so the black hole microstates are still what they are and you just add a spectator system that will not help you in constructing uh, state independent operators. Uh, so this additional system can't just be a spectator. I mean that that can't that can't change the physics. Uh, and and lively, let me say there's like there are, there's a two black hole space time and there's a larger black hole and I want to look at things instead of a smaller black hole. Does that make sense? Um, well, I don't know. No, I mean you'd have to make that more precise. Uh, you, no. you know, one natural example in ADS is just to look at small black holes in ADS, uh, which uh, do not dominate the ensemble. And the same argument, in fact, would tell you that for small black holes in ADS. Uh, you don't necessarily need uh, state dependence or there's no good argument for structure at the horizon. Uh, I, mean, I mean, just to, I mean, even for large black holes, but there's a fictitious larger black hole. Uh, that's, I mean, I, I understand this very vague, but does it make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we can discuss this offline, but you know, it doesn't, uh, the, the point is if you have a large black hole, there is a Hilbert space in the theory, right? So there's no, there's no space for anything to be fictitious. If there's a large black hole, that black hole is embedded in something of size e to the s and you're asking about typical states within that larger Hilbert space. So uh, that we don't have, you know, what you can do is you can take the whole ADS system and you can couple it to a different theory. Uh, but if that different theory is just a spectator, uh, then that will not help you in resolving uh, this issue. So, you know, if the original set of black holes you're considering are all just large ADS black holes, uh, then that's just what you have. You know, the fact that you have a spectator theory doesn't help. Uh, so somehow you need a theory in which, you know, black holes are embedded naturally. And you need a theory in which, uh, you know, these different mic black hole microstates have a small inner product. Uh, and that you would not get just by enlarging the Hilbert space of ADS black holes, just by coupling it to a bath or something. No, ADS black holes will still be ADS black holes. And just because you coupled it to a bath, you wouldn't uh, find something. Okay, thanks. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you explain why you said that the measured elements are surprised by the coping relation and should be able to find uh, yeah, I'm having some problems with uh, the question was why is why is one uh, why is one thing with Hawking radiation? Yeah, so I was just saying that you know uh, the uh, I I think I understood I, I hope I understood the question clearly. I was just saying that uh, you know these black holes uh, live in um, uh, a larger Hilbert space, so they're exponentially atypical. So you know one thing we've been emphasizing uh, previously is if we are, if you're willing to live with the fact even for large black holes that mirror operators only work in an exponentially small set of states in the Hilbert space, then there's no obstruction to that. But clearly, if I said that, you know, my mirror operators work for like 10 states in the Hilbert space, I would be able to find a state independent construction for those 10 states just by adding from one to 10. Uh, and, uh, you know, there would be no problem with that. Uh, similarly, you know, if my mirror operators were even like, you know, e to the s by 10 instead of e to the s, uh, that would probably be fine. You know, I would not need to have this state dependence. Uh, so you see, so that's what I'm saying here in that these, the flat space black holes or small ADS black holes are embedded within a larger Hilbert space, but they're exponentially atypical states. So you might be able to construct the mirror operators for each microstate and then add up the mirror operators in this way. And uh, you would still not necessarily run into trouble because these cross terms are, you know, a naive estimate of the size of these cross terms that were causing trouble in the large ADS black hole case was the size of the Hilbert space. But here, the size of the Hilbert space is controlled by the dimension of the, the full Hilbert space, which is much larger in the dimension of the black hole Hilbert space because the Hawking radiation has more entropy. Uh, I don't know if I answered the question because I don't know if I heard it correctly. Yeah, thank you. My question was why the, the matrix elements are surprised by the entropy of the Hawking radiation and not the one of the black hole. And you answer, which is because it's the size of the Hilbert, that's because by the size of the Hilbert space. Right, right, right. So it's a naive estimate. Uh, so this, this, this estimate is just a naive estimate, exactly, because it's, and I'm just estimating naively the size of the Hilbert space. It could be that this is not correct. You see, it could be that the black hole microstates are like bunched up in one part of the Hilbert space so that the inner product between them is also e to the minus s. And if that's the case, then you would have the same problem here. 
So the question here is, you know, how, can one understand how black hole microstates are distributed in this bigger Hilbert space, which we don't know the answer to. Okay, good. Uh, I want to say one, one last thing, uh, uh, which is about uh, uh, classical solutions. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as uh, there's something we discussed very briefly, and I'll, I'll try and be, be fast. Uh, you know, as you know, a number of classical microstate geometries have been found. So there is this, there are these examples of these classical microstate geometries, which have the property that they have the same charges or same mass as a black hole, but they're different solutions. And the way they avoid the no hair theorem is by taking some compact direction. So the compact direction, which pinches off before the horizon is reached. So the compact direction shrinks off to zero. And so this is a classical microstate geometry and, and a large class of very interesting solutions have been found and they've been used to, to do many interesting things. And in the fuzzball proposal, the proposal is about uh, you know, is that you should replace, you should have structured the horizon and you should have structured the horizon using fuzzballs. And there might be a case to be made for fuzzballs in for large areas black holes as we just described previously. Uh, but the question I want to ask is, you know, do the, the fact that you have some microstate geometries, does that add substantive evidence to the fact that for typical states, uh, you have structure at the horizon? Okay, so I'm asking a limited question. The solutions clearly exist and they're interesting and there might be other arguments one might be able to make for typical states. Uh, but the question I want to ask is, what do the existence of these classical geometries uh, tell you about uh, typical states? Okay. So let me just uh, point out a few constraints from statistical mechanics. First, uh, let me remind you that we, we have the property that for any observable, if, if psi1 and psi2 are typical, then we know that for any observable, you have this, you know that the difference of the expectation value of any observable is suppressed by the entropy of the system. Okay? And so uh, that tells you that these classical microstate geometries, all of which have different features, cannot all represent typical states. Okay? So there must be a distinguished a distinguished geometry that replaces the standard geometry. And the reason I say this is because notice that, you know, because the expectation value of any observable in a typical state must be the same as the expectation value of the observable in a different typical state, you cannot have different geometries corresponding to different typical states because the metric itself is an observable. And so you expect that the expectation value of the metric in one typical state is the same as the expectation value of the metric in another typical state. And you cannot have, you know, one geometry which has, which is of some kind, which has some features somewhere, another geometry of a different kind corresponding to, so, you know, it cannot be that psi one uh, has uh, some three wiggles and psi two has 10 wiggles, uh, that's not possible because, you know, the, the number of wiggles that you have in this, or by wiggle, I just mean some feature, I'm being very imprecise, uh, but it can't be that, you know, psi one has some feature and psi two has some other feature in the metric, uh, because uh, if this was the case, it would run afoul of this constraint, which is the two typical states have to look identical. So what is sometimes said is that, uh, you know, uh, the average geometry is the black hole geometry, so it's sometimes argued that the average geometry is the conventional geometry. But these, uh, but microstate geometries might give a basis So, you know, maybe they give a basis 
but a basis is never a typical state, right? Because a typical state is always a sum over basis. So maybe you have these microstate geometries, FI, and a typical state is generally AI, FI. And if that is the case, you know, even if the basis has some distinguished properties, uh, you know, it would not be the case that the sum of basis elements uh, would have those distinguished properties. Uh, one example that's often given is, you know, think of qubits. Uh, you can think of a very atypical set, which is a basis, which is where all, you know, you have qubits and all the qubits are either zero or one. So then eigenstate of the spin Z operator at all sides. So you have an N chain qubit chain and you can think of, you know, a basis. So something like this. So this is the basis of states, but none of these are typical states because a typical state is a sum of all of these. So this is the basis and all these states are atypical. So sometimes, uh, you know, one might imagine that the classical geometries give you a basis, uh, even if they can't give you typical states, and it's only the average that gives you the conventional geometry. Uh, but in fact, there are some statistical constraints also on basis elements, uh, which I want to just emphasize uh, very briefly. And these statistical constraints are as follows. Okay? Say we have an observable. Uh, one can make this a little bit more precise, uh, but I, I'll be a little bit more schematic. Uh, but in the review, in the lecture notes, you can find references to where this is made more precise. But say we have an observable, so that the fluctuations in the observable divided by the expectation value of the observable are small. So let's say we have an observable and they're suppressed by uh, the large parameter in the game, which for uh, thermal systems is always the entropy. Okay? In fact, there are many examples of such observables and the metric itself, as I'll explain later, is of this kind because the metric has a large uh, expectation value. It has some classical expectation value and its fluctuations are small. Or, you know, the area, for instance, that we've been discussing is of this kind where the fluctuations in the area are suppressed by G Newton, uh, but there's a classical expectation value which dominates. So in any case, let us say we have such an observable, then most basis elements, uh, and most meaning that all except for an order one over S fraction, Fi must have So you see, it cannot be that, so this is what I will show you in a minute. So it cannot be that you have basis elements which differ widely from each other and they add up in such a way so as to give you the right average for this observable. If you have an observable whose fluctuations are small. Let me just first prove this inequality, which is just some simple statistical inequality. Um, and uh, this inequality is pretty simple to prove. You see, what is the definition of the expectation of this, uh, this fluctuation? It is you measure the expectation value of A squared and you subtract off the expectation value of A, the whole squared. Uh, but you can rewrite this A squared Fi minus So here is one term and I'll write one more term. So you can rewrite, this is just a, a, a simple uh, equality, uh, which follows because, you know, I subtracted off this term, which was sum of Fi A Fi squared here in the first line. I added it back here, which is, I see here again, sum of I Fi A I squared. And, uh, you know, I get this expectation of A squared, but from here, I'll get a minus expectation of A squared, which will precisely give me this, because I get minus two into this, into this, and a plus expectation of A squared. That's the, but the average of this is the expectation of A times E to the S. And so I'll get back precisely this term. You can check the algebra, uh, but it's, it's quite simple. But notice that both of these terms are positive terms, right? Because the expectation value of the square of an observable uh, is, uh, you know, is, is larger than the square of the expectation value. So this is a positive term for each I. And this is uh, some term which is the total squared, and therefore it's also positive. So in particular, you see, if it was the case that A 
if this uh, happened to have the property that this was order one for an order one fraction of fi, then it's clear that you would find that sigma squared would also be order one, right? Because if this was, or if the second term here was order one, then if it was order one for an order one fraction, then of course the average of the second term would give you some contribution here, which once you normalize by A will also give you something that's order one. So you see that the only way it can be that the fluctuations divided by the expectation value is small is if almost all basis elements are close to the expectation value. It could be that there are some anomalous basis elements which you know have some large deviation from the mean, but almost all basis elements or one minus order one over S basis elements must be within a fraction of order one over S of the mean expectation value. Now, why is this relevant for black holes? It's relevant for black holes because the metric and other geometric observables do satisfy, at least outside the horizon. And this is pretty simple to see. You see, this is because, you know, the, the metric has some classical expectation value. And what are the fluctuations in the metric? The fluctuations in the metric are quantum fluctuations and they are controlled by G Newton times a factor of the energy. So one, uh, another way to write them is they are controlled by RH divided by L Planck to the power D minus two. This is just by dimensional analysis that, you know, fluctuations in the geometry are controlled by a factor of G Newton. And then I've just put in the, an energy factor to make up the dimensions. And that is precisely order one over S. So the, you know, this is something you can check with the Euclidean computation. You can compute fluctuations of the metric or fluctuations of other geometric quantities. And if you have a geometric quantity which has a non-zero classical expectation value, then its fluctuations are suppressed by order one over S. So it cannot be the case that the basis solutions of these microstate geometries. So the you know microstate geometries cannot represent typical basis elements either because they all have the property that they deviate at an order one amount, not in some order S amount, they all deviate in order one amount from the Schwarzschild geometry. And that follows from this uh, statistical constraint uh, that I prescribed. But just to be clear, you know, this is not, this does not answer the question that we asked some time back. It could be that, you know, for some other reason, uh, there is structure of the horizon. Uh, but uh, the fact that one finds a set of classical solutions, uh, which are extremely interesting in their own right, that one can find classical solutions and one can do many things with them. Uh, these classical solutions cannot represent typical basis elements. Uh, because of the statistical inequality that we just showed. Uh, so just to recap, the inequality was just that if you can find any observable which has the property that, uh, you know, the, the fluctuation of the observable divided by the expectation value is suppressed by order one over S. And for such an observable, almost all basis elements have to have an expectation value that's very close to the average expectation value. Second, we said that the metric and other geometric quantities are examples of observables of this kind. Microstate geometries, you know, do not satisfy the property. I mean, that's why they're geometries because they're found using classical an analysis. They do not satisfy the property of being close to the, the Schwarzschild black hole at order one over S. They deviate at order one. There are various parameters that control how these geometries deviate, but they deviate in some macroscopic way from the average, uh, from the black hole geometry. And so such geometries cannot be typical basis elements uh, for uh, the black hole. Uh, although, of course, there are other states. I mean, there are clearly states in the theory which are of interest in their own right, uh, but they cannot represent typical basis elements. Uh, so that's just one more loose end uh, in this question uh, about do typical states have structure? Uh, uh, we discussed various uh, arguments for and against that, uh, but the fact that one finds solutions cannot be an argument for typical states to have structure for this reason. Um, 
so that is uh, in fact all i wanted to say for today uh, so i see that uh, we have uh, five minutes uh, left uh, so uh, let me uh, give you a, a five minute uh, summary of uh, various things so at least one five minute takeaway uh, from uh, this this course uh, uh, i i by the way i i i'll probably try and record a, a brief maybe 10 or 15 minute summary and and put it up online which might be useful which is more detailed uh, but let me just try and uh, give you a, a few minute takeaway from the course. Uh, you know, uh, this was a course about the, the information paradox. But one of the things I tried to emphasize was that the information paradox is not one paradox. Okay, it's some, it's some web of interconnected puzzles. So one of the things we started with was Hawking's original paradox. And we had some resolution to that. And the resolution to that was that, you know, pure states are very close to, to thermal states. And then we said, well, maybe that's too fast. We need to think a little bit more carefully. We found some results from quantum information. And then we found some other paradoxes. So we found this monogamy paradox And uh, you know there was also just thinking more carefully about Hawking's argument, this argument from the principle of ignorance. And the resolution uh, to these paradoxes was that you know you had the holography of information, and so you know you you the monogamy paradox is not a paradox because it is indeed the case that quantum gravity stores information unusually and degrees of freedom far away know about degrees of freedom in the black hole interior. Then there was a, another set of paradoxes that we moved on to, which was about ADS black holes coupled to non-gravitational baths. Uh, here, the paradox was if you use the naive techniques of holographic entanglement entropy and you computed the entropy of these ADS black holes coupled to non-gravitational baths, one would find that the entropy would just keep growing without bound, which would be a paradox. And the resolution here was by islands. And uh, then in the last part of the course, we discussed the question of the interior of typical ADS black holes, which had its own set of paradoxes. And the resolution here that we found was by means of state dependence. So in any case, uh, there's a large uh, set of paradoxes or some and there are other paradoxes that we consider as well. Uh, you know, paradoxes about the late time behavior of the two point function. And there are similar other paradoxes that are resolved by exponentially small effects. So there's a large web of interconnected paradoxes that have to do with black holes. Uh, there is no one information paradox. There are many puzzles about black holes. And what is interesting about these puzzles is that they all teach us uh, something interesting and nice uh, about uh, quantum gravity. Uh, for instance, uh, as we emphasized when we were discussing the principle of holography of information, uh, this is something that holds even in the absence of quantum gravity. Uh, so if you were to ask, you know, what is one way in which quantum gravity just in, in the space around us is different, uh, here is an effect uh, that one finds by studying black holes, uh, but is applicable even otherwise, even and is relevant even at low energies. And so it's something of interest. It's something of great interest for quantum gravity in general. Uh, similarly, you know, state dependence, if we think it is correct, is something of interest. If state dependence is not correct and there are firewalls or there are fuzzballs, that would also be of great interest. And so all of these puzzles uh, teach us uh, something very interesting uh, about quantum gravity. And uh, there's, of course, uh, much more uh, that needs to be done, uh, but uh, that will have to be for another course. Uh, 
so I just wanted to end by, uh, you know, thanking all of you uh, who've been attending the course. I know, you know, the times have also been all over the place and there are people from uh, many different parts uh, who've come. Uh, so I certainly had uh, a, a very good time uh, giving these lectures and uh, your questions and the interaction helped a lot. Uh, thanks very much also to uh, Chandramoli, uh, but all good things have to come to an end. Uh, so I see we're just out of time for the last lecture as well. And so uh, we'll stop this lecture and uh, thank you once again for all of those who attended and participated in the course. Uh, we can have some more discussion as usual now. Thank you. Thank you very much for this work. Thank you, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Sobra. That was a great course. Thanks, thanks, Radia. Yeah, Sobra, thanks also from uh, Amsterdam. And thanks also for uh, Chandra Muli for all his uh, uh, discussion session. So, yeah, yeah we uh, really appreciate the course. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Uh, thank you. So are there any last questions? I mean, we can, of course, yeah, you should feel free to get in touch and have, if you have questions later. Um, but if there are any more questions now, we can take them. Can you say something about state dependence and cosmology? Oh, is there some meaning of state dependence and cosmology? Is that the question? Yeah, and, and uh, whether it's more uh, easy to check it or something like that, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that's pretty interesting here is, you know, we consider things in a, yeah, uh, you know, one could even take a step, step back and say, if, uh, letting aside realistic cosmology is what about just the sitter space? Uh, and a lot of these questions, I think, uh, very interesting uh, to try and generalize them to the sitter space. Uh, but uh, we don't, uh, we, we don't have a good understanding of many of these issues uh, in the sitter space. Uh, so, um, I think that's a that's a great question, but that's not something I think we have a good answer to. I'm, okay. yeah. So I, I have a another question about the state dependence also. So so in the discussion of mirror operators and and in the and also in the existence of the uh, phi CFT which gives correct green function uh, correlation functions, we associate state dependence to the interior of the black hole, and. Uh, so and if there are no if there is no interior that that means uh, they, there is no such state dependence uh, and yeah go on please yeah and so but then does it mean that the conflict in rt formula is more profound because it arises from the assumption that metric is state independent not by invoking some interior of the black hole thing right right so so it's an exactly so it's an example of a situation where you know it it looks like uh, this issue also arises outside in the exterior so certainly, you know, if you just look at correlation functions of fields, uh, there's no argument that says that you have to have state dependence. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the RT formula, it says that there's state dependence. Of course, one resolution is that there might be, you know, maybe the correct answer is not that area is equal to entanglement entropy, but area is equal to something else, which is a state independent operator, uh, which happens to, you know, be approximated by the entanglement entropy for some set of states. Uh, so that's a possibility. Uh, which we can't rule out, right? It could be that maybe area is area is something else, and area is not entanglement entropy. Uh, so this issue would only arise if you were to take this formula uh, very seriously. Uh, but it could be that you know may, maybe the correct formula is something that we need to discover, which is area is something, and uh, entanglement entropy happens to be a good a very good approximation for some kinds of states. But maybe in general that's not the right right thing. So th that's a possibility, and there's nothing. Yeah. Okay. I have a rela related question, which is that, like, when you when you consider observers on the horizon itself, it seems that both the state in the mirror operators and the outset mode should, uh, up, like, limit to that value, right? Correctly, even for area, or even field correlations, and so on. Uh, but they also, you see, that also happens in the interior. In the interior, we're talking about the mirrors, but the ordinary operators also contribute. And remember, the way uh, this goes is that you know we have a horizon and. You have these right movers, which just continue. You know, in ADS, the way things work is that you have both left and right movers, which are both given by these modes, and then you have some other interior modes, which are like 
so if you look at some or uh, some field here, it has both the ordinary and the mirror operators. It doesn't only have the mirror operators. Uh, let, 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 what if like I'm looking at right moving uh, observers on the horizon? So it's uh, it's not very obvious to me that uh, how the tilde and a a mode calculations concept. Uh, it's not very obvious how the a tilde mode calculation comes up. Sorry. Uh, so uh, it's I mean uh, maybe the snipe, but like if you're looking at some right moving correlators on the horizon, it's it. The a tilde and a a correlators should coincide, right? Oh, how how does it coincide? How 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 do you how do you make sure the field is is uh, is continuous? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, you know, th th this this two point function that we had, which gives you this a tilde and a omega, like giving you an e to the minus beta omega by two, uh, that ensures that the two point function is continuous. You know, that's how we derived it actually. Remember, you now how did we derive this? Right. Uh -huh. We derived it by looking at this two point function and then by smearing it. So uh, it it is continuous. Uh, you're right. It's not it's not totally obvious that it's continuous, but it is continuous. And I mean, it had to be because that's how we derived it. We derived it by demanding that the two point function is one by x one minus x two squared, and that's just continuous as you go across. Uh, and uh, you're right that as you go from the horizon, you could ask, you know, how a tilde has changed into a's, and how did it work continuously? But it does work continuously. And does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, I have a nice question. Uh, uh, can we uh, construct uh, some similar type of statistical violation for Ryu Takanagi case, like with some unitary perturbation? Yeah, I don't know that anything has of this kind has been studied in detail, and there's no such uh, no such violation that has been constructed. Okay. Uh, so there's, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the violation, yeah. Uh, so it, it is a question that could be asked, you know, let's say you assume that S is equal to A by 4G Newton holds uh, for typical states. Uh, are there two states you can find so that, you know, S is very different? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. And in principle, I think it should be answerable, but I think it has not uh, been, uh, been asked. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not been answered. It's been asked, but not been answered. So I, I, it's, it's, I think, an interesting question, but uh, as far as I know, the answer to that is not known. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we can close. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for, for coming uh, and for attending the lectures. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, yeah, see each other again at some point. So thank you again.